Good, good morning, everyone. So uh, I've met the majority of you. Uh, my name is Eli. I recently joined the administrative team across the street. Uh, today, I'll be talking about uh, the management of uh, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. So uh, before I start, I really want to thank uh, people on both sides of the street. I think uh, you guys have made my transition here very seamless, and you guys are all very kind and very smart. And I'm actually learning so much from all of you. And the residents, especially, very strong group here. So thank you so much for incorporating me into your team. So uh, full disclosure, I know there has to be a financial disclosure portion of this. Um, yeah, I'm broke. So there's, there's not much. And please excuse the hospital shoot scrubs. I am clinical across the street today. Uh, I didn't mean to be rude. So uh, quickly, I want to talk about why I'm, uh, I'm discussing this topic today. Uh, many people in the audience uh, know this gentleman. He's a mentor and a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Billy Caputo. And when I was a second year resident, I essentially presented a case that appeared as if it was subarachnoid hemorrhage, but I completely uh, missed many of the very important time intervals that I'll be discussing. So he talked to me afterwards and advised me that identify your weakness. And when you identify your weakness, you can make that your strength. So ever since then, any topic that I've lectured on or have done a lit search on, it's been because I exposed that as one of my weaknesses and I've tried to turn that into my strength. I really advise the residency to go ahead and, uh, and use that model for your uh, education. So quickly, the lecture goals. And Sophia told me while I was making this lecture an observation that I have to put the hashtag because it's a thing. I didn't know about this. So uh, quickly, I want to talk about uh, the utility of a knock-on CT head. And of course, that's your classic uh, uh, starfish pattern of a subarachnoid hemorrhage there. Uh, when is LP going to be your next step? Uh, how to interpret the LP results? And when is CT angio an option on the table? So quickly, we'll start off with a case of a 40-year-old that comes in with a complaint of a headache. And immediately upon seeing a patient, you try to risk stratify. And when you risk stratify your patients, uh, when you look at the literature and the symptomology on presentation, you see there really isn't one thing that could help you kind of clinch the diagnosis. Uh, the presentation seems to be all over the place. So what about the whole worst headache of my life, the entire thunderclap headache component uh, of the presentation? Well, when they actually took a look at patients who had confirmed subarachnoid hemorrhage, retrospectively, they found that this was present about 50% of the time in the history. When they took a look at patients who had a sudden onset of headache that reached max intensity within an hour or so and had a normal neurological exam, the incidence of subarachnoid was only about 6%. This was composed of about three studies that had a total of about 5,300 patients. So what about the Ottawa subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage rule? Well, once again, you see that there are some interesting components of this rule. Uh, the one that really stands out to me and I think is most important is the onset during exertion. Please keep subarachnoid in mind for your patients when they are working out at the gym, lift something and develop a sudden onset headache. Also during sexual acti activity, um, the, the strengths of the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rule, well, it has a sensitivity of 100% of everything is negative. Unfortunately, the specificity is pretty low. So when we talk about this clinical decision rule, one of the weaknesses, like we just said, is the specificity. You're not really going to be able to clinch the diagnosis with this. Uh, however, it has been recently uh, externally validated, something that was initially attributed as one of its weaknesses. And then this always comes up in the conversation during the initial evaluation. What about the Hunt and Hess? I think there may be uh, some confusion about this. This is actually more prognostic, not diagnostic. The goal of Hunt and Hess is to take patients who have a confirmed subarachnoid hemorrhage, put them in one of these uh, five categories. And based on this, it gives you essentially a mortality uh, a percentage for these patients. As you can see at stage five, you have a 90% mortality. So, the main first part of this lecture I wanted to illustrate was there isn't really one thing you can use to clinch this diagnosis. You really need to take into consideration the entire picture. History is very important as well as physical exam. So let's go back quickly to the case. 40 year old comes in with a complaint of a headache. It's really all about timing when you look at the literature. The first question that always comes up is, is whether or not a normal CT head within six hours of symptom onset good enough to rule out a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So obviously we go back to the literature and reading is lit. And to be honest with you, I didn't know what lit meant until a few years ago. Apparently it can be used as a good or a bad thing. Uh, so I'm going to bring up four studies really quickly uh, and we'll go through them because I only have uh, about 25 minutes for this lecture. So Perry is one of the major contributors to the literature on this topic. 
And when they evaluated the sensitivity of a CT performed within six hours of symptom onset, they took 3,000 patients who had a confirmed headache. They put them into two different groups. The first group had about 1,000 patients, and they obtained their CT within six hours of symptom onset. The second group had about 2,000 patients, and their CT was after six hours. So six hours is this major point of demarcation. When they look at the first group, they found that 850 patients had no subarachnoid hemorrhage on CT. And when they followed those patients for three months, none had negative outcomes. This was one of the major reasons why they felt comfortable saying six hours is a good mark to help rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. The group number two, 17 of these patients had a normal CT, but they ended up having a, a positive lumbar puncture. Essentially, Perry confirmed... Uh, Perry uh, demonstrated that the sensitivity of a non-con CT within six hours is about 95%. I'm sorry about the square. We had to convert it. Um, we had to convert it. It's supposed to be an arrow. The sensitivity of a non-con CT had after six hours actually ends up dropping to 85%. And I'll later demonstrate that after about five days, it drops even further. Uh, the second study I want to bring up is by Biggs. Um, they wanted to, this was a single uh, center retrospective study of about 250 patients, and they determined the same thing. Non-con CT had within six hours is about 98% and drops after the six hour mark. The Biggs article demonstrated that about five out of the 76 patients had a normal CT after six hours, but once again, a positive lumbar puncture. So we keep seeing this pattern for patients who are after the six hour mark. The third study really quickly, Sayer, this was an observational study, and they essentially asked a simple question, is CT without LP enough? And this study incorporated patients of many different time, during, uh, um, many different time uh, intervals. There were patients who had sudden onset headaches, but they also had patients who had headache up to about five or six days or so in the study. And they took about 2,000 patients. They had a normal CT, but still underwent an LP irrelevant of when they presented. So even the patients under six hours received an LP in the study and 92 of these LPs ended up being positive. From these positive LPs, they ended up having, a, uh, they ended up having imaging afterwards and they found eight had a confirmed aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. So they confirmed a miss rate of about 0.4%. There were really no clinically significant bleeds and these eight patients, when they look back at them, they found that they, were present, they presented well after that six hour mark. So once again, this is all just to demonstrate that six hour mark in the literature continues to be relevant and continues to be, uh, I guess, a, a good time of demarcation of whether or not you need an LP. Carpenter et al. is the final study for this uh, segment. Essentially look at, looked at patients who had a normal CT within six hours and asked a simple question of how many LPs do I need to perform to detect one aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage? or the number needed to LP. And this was recently featured on MRAP as well, and this was determined to be about 15,000 patients. So if you have someone, if you have someone who has a normal head CT, a normal neurological exam, and this was within six hours of sympt symptom onset, you really don't need to LP these patients because you'll probably be doing more harm than good. In conclusion, a non-con CT head has been demonstrated uh, within six hours has been demonstrated to be good enough to detect uh, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage without an LP. The sensitivity is about 95 to 100%, depending on which study you want to reference. However, it drops dramatically afterwards because theoretically, you have to imagine the blood is going into the uh, spinal canal. It's moving away from the head. It's no longer in the area where it can be detected. So what about LP? Well, the Perry study demonstrated that it does have a great sensitivity. But the problem with LP is a lot of the times it's equivocal. Uh, we really can't tell whether it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage, is it a traumatic tap, many things can happen. So it is also invasive. It's time consuming. It does have a high false positive rate, especially with the uh, traumatic taps. And it can be difficult to interpret. So this is the major question that happens, right? Are we dealing with a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a traumatic tap? I put, to, I put this together quickly. Uh, essentially, four patients, four different LP results. And the question becomes, which one of these patients are you comfortable saying, yes, this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, yes, this is a traumatic tap? And the ones that I really want you to focus on is the patient in the blue, patient three, and the patient in the green, patient four. Patient in the blue actually has low RBCs to start, patient in the green 
has a very rapid decline afterwards. But which is a subarachnoid and which is a traumatic tap? Let's go through some of the literature that actually analyzed these, these questions. So how do you interpret it? Is it the red blood cell count in tube one? Is it the count in tube four? Are you taking the absolute difference? Uh, yeah, and Dr. Sinard is absolutely uh, shaking his head no. So it gets a little bit confusing. A great study done by Sussman, uh, this was published in Academic uh, Emergency Medicine, where it was a case series. They looked at about 4,500 uh, patients who had an LP, and the criteria was they had to have a headache, they had to have evaluation for subarach, they had to have an LP, and they had to have some type of neurovascular imaging within two weeks so they can compare whether or not something was missed. The learning point number one from this study was that Sussman stated it is the percent change of the RVCs, not the absolute difference, not the isolated tube itself. It is the percent change between tube one to tube four that really matters. And specifically, it's a 63% reduction. If you have a 63% reduction from tube one to tube four or greater, you should feel pretty comfortable saying that that was a traumatic tap. Learning point number two, none of the patients who had a final RBC count in tube four of less than 100 had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So going back to this, uh, to this diagram or this demonstration here, although patient number three in the blue started off with a low RBC count, they did not have a 63% reduction. I'm not sure I'm very comfortable stating that that patient has a traumatic tap. I'm more comfortable stating patient four who started off with so many more RBCs had a traumatic tap based on the 63% reduction. So let's jump to the next section on xanthochromia. So xanthochromia, uh, we know it's because of blood in the CSF, but just keep in mind that it does take two hours to develop. Uh, if you are very efficient and somehow in a system where you obtain the CT head and somehow an LP within two hours of everything going on, you theoretically may miss this. It does have a good sensitivity and specificity. And of course, it's due to the hemoglobin degradation products. This is a very interesting slide because with sensitivity, uh, with time, some of the imaging modalities uh, may have a change in sensitivity. I've already demonstrated that a non-con CT head will have a very big decline in uh, sensitivity from about 95% to 58% by day five. However, the MRI sensitivity increases uh, as time goes on. And when asked the question as to why that is, it's actually due to hemosiderin. When blood continues to break down, hemosiderin is formed and is de deposited within the uh, subarachnoid space, and that is easily picked up by MRI. So MRI may be a better option uh, five or six days out. <clears throat> so there can be circumstances when LP is not an option. And we know many of the contraindications. They are tested frequently on the boards, increased intracranial pressure, some type of bleeding diathesis, uh, soft tissue infection at the site, platelet count less than 50 and INR greater than 1.7. These seem to be sometimes tested uh, for board purposes. However, in clinical settings, I think uh, you take it with a grain of salt. So what would be the next steps in this situation where you're after the six hour mark, LP is really not the best option. This is where the discussion of whether or not CTA, is, whether or not CTA is the appropriate next step comes about. So can CTA replace LP? A nice study uh, done by McCormick, uh, which was also published in Academic Emergency Medicine, essentially looked at the pathway of CT followed by CTA versus CT followed by LP. Which is better? Does one cause more misses than the other? And it was a retrospective review, and they ended up doing some type of probability theory to calculate the predictive outcome. It was a little bit confusing, but interesting to read. And they determined that CT followed by LP is actually 100% sensitive with a negative predictive value of close to 100%. Uh, the post-test probability with the CT-CTA reached 99.43. So in conclusion, CT followed by LP is still the best, but CT followed by CTA in certain circumstances is still pretty good enough in my opinion. So in conclusion, and once again, I'm sorry about the slides, we had to convert them this morning, guys. Uh, in conclusion, if you have some more than acute onset of headache, symptoms less than 48 hours, if you're using the paper I just described, and an intact neurological exam, a CT-CTA uh, can be a good option for your patient. 
But what's the downside of CTA? And this always comes up. Well, it has a high false positive rate or in a, not too high, but it is there. It's essentially a false positive rate of 2%. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that 2% of the time, you've detected some kind of aneurysm in your patient that really did not contribute to the patient's headache. Why is this important? It's important because now, if, imagine you have a patient with migraines and this patient comes into the ER and they complain of headaches frequently. And they say, oh, by the way, doc, I have an aneurysm that was detected on, on a CT a while back. That's going to affect your management and maybe lead to some downstream consequences for the patient. I want to transition quickly into the treatment, treatment aspect of the uh, presentation. We do have some time. So quickly, the coagulation cascade. I give a whole other lecture on this, the reversal of antiplatelet and anticoagulation therapy. I think we're scheduled to give it in April, Sophia, if I'm maybe. Uh, Sophia is strict with the schedule. Uh, vital signs, vital signs, uh, are there blood pressure parameters where you want to keep these patients? What's the deal with nemotipine and essentially endovascular coiling? Uh, it, are, you at a, are you at a center that has it and whether you need to get your patient there? So quickly, nemotipine, the recommendation is 60 milligrams, either P or NG. This is not given through the IV. And you have up until 48 hours to give it. And the theory behind this is that it's supposed to reduce the uh, ischemia secondary to the vasospasm that happens. There's a delayed vasospasm with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Interestingly enough, and I'll let anyone from the audience please comment on this, the literature is kind of uh, not all there for this. They have done studies where they looked at patients who received nemotipine and they looked at images before and after, and they weren't really able to demonstrate that this drug worked from an imaging point of view. So there was no really uh, reversible ischemia detected on imaging. However, there are some other studies where clinical exam improved after nemotipine. So that's where I think the majority of the push for this medication comes from. Quickly, in terms of vital signs, uh, you want to maintain your systolic blood pressure between 140 to 160 or the MAP between 80 to 100. To do so, nicotipine is the agent of choice. However, uh, many people have started shifting to clavidipine. Clavidipine is just a little bit more easy on, easy off. I look at it as like the esmolol of the calcium channel blockers almost. You could just turn it on, turn it off quickly. And this is an interesting question. I, in one of the other lectures that I give, it, it is repeatedly demonstrated that calcium channel blockers are the neuroprotective agents of choice for anything neurological when you're trying to reduce the blood pressure. So I asked a few toxicologists uh, who I trust dearly and essentially asked why. And interestingly enough, in the final stages of neuronal death, there needs to be a huge calcium influx. And the theory is that calcium channel blockers may prevent this calcium influx from taking place, thereby preventing neuronal cell death. <clears throat> When you're intubating these patients, I like to do it at a third degree angle, neuroprotective intubation with fentanyl to help prevent the sympathetic response. Sucks versus rock. For us, I don't think it really matters. Uh, your neurologist may want you to go with sucks for a quicker, quick onset to the next neurological exam that they could perform. And quite frankly, whether or not to give uh, anti-epileptics, the literature seems to be all over the place as well for this. Before I go to the learning points, one additional thing I, I guess I would like to bring up was an uh, interesting, interesting study uh, sent out by Dr. Sinner yesterday about the role of TXA in these patients. I just briefly uh, read the caption that was sent out. It seems that TXA in these cases early on also was not demonstrated to uh, uh, have a great benefit. Dr. Sinner, anything else to add? So essentially uh, the learning point uh, for this uh, lecture is that a subarachnoid, if you're concerned for subarachnoid hemorrhage and you have your patient within six hours, non-con CT head should be good enough. And once again, please remember, these are patients with intact neurological exams, non-focal findings. If you're concerned and it's more than six hours, CTLP seems to be the better approach, but CTC, CTCTA, in my opinion, does seem to be an okay alternative. And if you're dealing with whether or not your spinal tap is traumatic or not, use 63% reduction to help, to help guide you in that decision-making. It's been a pleasure. Thank you guys. These are my two sons. Uh, I'll take any questions if you have. Yeah, one point I think that you made is really good. That, and one of the reasons though that, that it's hard to get an LP is not so many 
the contraindications that you mentioned. In my experience, the patients are afraid of it. Unless they're feeling really sick, which sometimes they aren't after six hours, they'll refuse it, but they won't refuse another CTA. So I've been forced a few times to do CTAs, even though I know it's maybe not as good as an LP, but almost as good, mm -hmm. uh, because patients just are very afraid no matter how much you talk to them. That's a good point. To tell you the truth, I switch completely to CTA. So when I do, because I do it for stroke too. So I, I think because the the, very, the technologists are thinking people can do it, and I can do it very quickly on the table to do the non-con CT and the non and the CTA at the same time. Then you don't have to wait for the reaction. This is in that. That was the reason that people kind of waited. There was no reason. And since ninety five percent of subarachnoids are not traumatic or from an aneurysm, you might as well find the aneurysm first. So the, also that the amount of Subarachnoid hemorrhages in patients with headache are extremely small. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like one to two percent of people who come to the emergency department with a headache. Since the number is very small, we're going to increase the number of CTAs, very small number. Okay. So, what I do, uh, six hours, greater than six hours, I do the CT and CTA at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, because the false positive rate <clears throat> of the LP is much greater than two percent. So I end up doing the CTA for the false positive rates of the LP. I just switch to the CTA. I, I do want to point out, though, probably, Dr. Tinner, your, I think probably your rate of having of, of thinking of this subarachnoid yeah. hemorrhage is present is probably pretty low because of your experience, because yeah. of your knowledge of the of the literature. I would I would urge uh, new practitioners or novice practitioners to, to heed Dr. Yusuf's warning because. If you're doing a lot more workups for subarachnoid hemorrhage, you are going to be doing more CTAs. Mm -hmm. Your false positive rate will go up. Your length of stay will go up. It, it is it's a difficult thing to kind of when, when you'll get that gestalt and that experience, you'll probably be less worried about. Because I, I think doing the CTA decreases the length of stay because the the study done at time zero. I don't have to wait for the LT, the false positive rate from the LT, to do the CTA. So I think doing the CTA decreases the length of stay because I get one exam. And I do that. I'm just worried about CT CTA being done on like every headache patient. Yeah, you can go too far. Yeah, I know. I know you're not going to do that, but I think you can go too far the other way. I also that, that paper. I read that paper a long time ago now. But the, the way they do it, it's, it's like almost like statistical magic. Yes, you know? it's not. It's a retrospective review. That like, and reading it, you need like a degree in statistics. But, it, but yeah. if you think about you know ninety percent, more than ninety percent of subarachnoid non traumatic subarachnoid. Term right. And how you make the diagnosis of an aneurysm on CTA? No, I agree. I agree. It makes sense. And that's why I think it is a tool. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess, Dr. Yusuf, I, I was going to ask you how, so, how do you approach this? Obviously, less than six hours, you get the CT done. Right. So, when, when it's out over six hours, CT non con is equivocal or negative. What do you say to the patient? You... So, uh, unfortunately, you know, I'm about five years out. I, I do not have the experience uh, of some of our mentors here. So I'm still at the point where I have a full discussion with the patient and give them the option. If there are any slightest contraindications, anticoagulants, antiplatelet therapy, I, I really do err on the side of going for the CTA just for safety purposes. But I, I do offer an LP for these patients. Uh, just another question about the data that you presented where like 74 percent 74 patients at 2000 with negative ct after six hours were found to have subarachnoid based on the lp but only eight of them had an uh, aneurysm correct but that sounds really much lower the rate of aneurysm in those patients with subarachnoid compared to the 95 percent of subarachnoids that are due to an aneurysm so correct. how did we know that those i didn't read the study but how do you know that those people really had a subarachnoid and not just a and it was a bloody that wasn't accounted for. Oh, because in that study they followed them up with they followed them up with some type of advanced imaging, either MRI or CT angio to confirm. So then they found yes. Okay. And so just another thing that from reading reading the literature, practicing, uh, nothing to absolute as Dr. Yusuf said in terms of patient characteristics. But if you notice all the CDRs that's come out and they all have decent sensitivity, the age is always 40 to 50. So that's something that I took to heart that. When you think about those patients who are 20, teenagers, 30 year olds, I think the incidence goes way down. So I think mm -hmm. that's just something to add to kind of your digital. And I think they're easy to help it. 
There is no reason. So yeah, it might be good for education. Yeah, the building is much better than doing the same thing. Yeah, the other thing sure. sometimes can help. Is there a family history of some harassment? Yeah. yeah. And there is. But if there is, that increases your. Right. Yeah, we've had previous animals. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would agree. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Helps more. rule it in, but not rule it out. Mark it. Yeah. Uh, there was a comment, or someone had a comment on uh, Robbie. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, just, I guess, one comment, one question. I just, for the, the more junior learners, we talked about, like, clinical decision tools. Um, just, like, I don't know, I think someone was talking about it using it as an aid. So, I guess, you know, who to use a, a clinical decision aid. We shouldn't be using these patients where we clinically rule out subarachnoid because you got to think about Bayesian theorem and your pretest probability. So, if this patient has a very low pretest probability, you're going to have, a, like, positive head CT is more likely to be false positive to making sure we're using the tools properly. Um, and then just going back to Stacy's lecture, making sure that we're ordering the head CTs uh, correctly. So you can't, for these, you have to make sure you're doing the correct indication, even though it's annoying. Um, you can't do like a normal exam. So, you're, cause you're not gonna get billed for it. So just make sure you're doing the correct indication. Um, and I guess the last question for Dr. Yusuf, sorry, is, uh, the MRIs, I guess, which patient would you be doing an MRI for? I guess, classically, MRIs is a longer wait for it, but I've noticed recently that MRIs actually take less time to, be, to get done than head CTs sometimes. So it, I guess, are we using MRIs at all? Or like, how would you be using an MRI? Uh, I really think that has to be institution specific. There were some places in New Jersey uh, that I know about where, for example, for stroke code, their first imaging modalities immediately in MRI. So I think it's really up to your institution here. From my experience at Kings County, I think irrespective of how many days out, I'm still going probably with a CT, CTA, CT, LP pathway, not really an MRI. Um, we have another question. How do we interpret the CTAs for patients with known aneurysms and an CTA when there's concern for that's a difficult question. That may be a, a radiologic uh, question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think you need an LP. I think you need to see if there's blood, blood in the CSF. I think, I think you need that. Yeah, probably if you know they have aneurysms and you're worried about blood subarach, you probably need to do an LP anyway. Yeah, just gonna show you the I mean, you can see. Yeah. It's like in trauma. Yeah. The CTA over the back when you see. Correct. Okay. Awesome. All right, guys. Um, all right. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, guys. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>